Good morning. Hope everybody's having a good day so far. I wanted to take a few moments to pray and read a little bit from. I got a morning devotional. Uh, well, it's Charles Spurgeon. I wanted to read something from that, and then we'll go to the scripture and read where he's where where he's quoting from here. And just giving everybody a few minutes. Romans 8. If you have a Bible, good idea to grab it and uh, and follow along. You don't ever want to take someone's word that they're reading the scripture to you or uh, that they know what's in the scriptures. You want to look at it for yourself. You don't depend on anyone to show you the things that you can find out on your own, and the things that you can look for yourself. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. <clears throat> Father in heaven, we come to you in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. And Lord, we just ask that you would guide us this day. Lord, that you would help us. Lord, for those out there starting their day, Lord, that you would guide us throughout. That you would uh, guide each of our steps. That you would keep us safe and keep us from temptation and keep us from the world. That we would walk in you your presence all day that you would you would control our, our our steps and our movements lord for those that are winding down in their evening lord that you would help them to rest that you would give them some peace that you would nourish them and nourish us with your word that you would let them get rid of the worries and the anxieties that the day may have tried to pile on them lord that they would be able to fully rest in your presence in your peace. Lord, this time we just ask that you would open your word to us, that you would have your spirit move in us and through us and around us, that we would understand and that we could feel your words in our in our hearts and in our minds, that we would know them to be true, that you would you would write them on our hearts, that we would have remembrance of them throughout our day and throughout our week, that we would be able to live them and put them into action and apply them and live in your will, Lord, that you would help us and that your spirit would continuously uh, show us the way to uh, navigate this life and to live in a world that's gone crazy, Lord, that you would keep us from this world, that we would be set apart to you and that you would open our eyes to your things, to your glory, to your presence and that we would, we would close our eyes and we would quit looking at and wanting the things of this world. Lord, that you would help us this time to read, understand, speak your word clearly, Lord, that you would use my mouth. And Lord, that this would be a message for each of us personally. Lord, that we could apply it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. So I want to read, uh, this is Charles Spurgeon's morning devotion. Uh, and I, I usually post these whenever I, uh, I get them every day and I try to post them every once in a while. But uh, this morning it was from Romans 8, 37 is where he, uh, he read from, but I would like to do it a little different. Um, and Romans 8, 37 says, Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. And so what I would like to do is instead of jumping into what Charles Spurgeon has to say about Romans 8, 37, um, about one verse, is I would like to read Romans 8 uh, straight through, and then we'll see what uh, Charles Spurgeon has to say about Romans 8, 37. And then we'll maybe stop and just uh, maybe we'll we'll look at our own our own uh, reasoning and and what the spirit's trying to tell us through Romans eight. Romans eight is a a very very good chapter. It's the 
basically it's a summation of our, our salvation, our New Testament salvation. And it, it, it tells you about it, the, the, it's a summary of it and then the completion of it at the rapture um, and then the absolute security of the child of God. And so um, in Romans 8, chapter, chapter 8, verse 1, there is, therefore, now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made us free from the law of sin and death. We were under the law of sin and death. And Jesus Christ by the law of the Spirit, gave us life in Christ Jesus and made us free from the law of sin and death. That's where you are if you're standing in, in Jesus Christ, if your faith is in Jesus Christ, if you're walking and following in Jesus Christ or believe on Jesus Christ, that's you. That's where we are now. If you're not in, if your standing is not on Jesus Christ, if you're not walking in his ways, if you've never given your life to him, then you are actually still um, under the law of sin and death. You're still under that bondage. Um, so that's where we are. Verse 3, For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, 100% God, but put on man. He put on skin. He walked in sinful flesh, the likeness of it. His flesh was not sinful. He controlled it. But it was the likeness of every other sinful person he was with. He looked just like us because he was 100% man and 100% God. And for sin... So God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh. He condemned it. That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. But they that are after the spirit the things of the Spirit. What are you mining? What are you looking out for? What are you searching for? Is it the things of the flesh? Is it always to feed your face, to feed your bank account, to feed your pride, to feed you, to feed your lust, your desires, your wants? Is it always about your physical flesh? Is that what you're looking out for? You look at your day, break it down. How many hours do I give to my spirit in feeding my spirit? How many hours am I searching for my spiritual things? And how many hours am I feeding my flesh? How many hours am I going after the flesh? And am I paying more attention to the fleshly, worldly things than I am the spiritual, godly things? That's a question we must ask ourselves. I would say that we would fail to say we would all, most of us would fail and to be able to say that we are walking after the Spirit. So it's just a question we must ask ourselves as if we're calling ourselves a child of God, are we walking after our Father or the Father of the world? For the to be cornally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. And that's what we have. You've got to get there. Christ gets us there. It's in Jesus Christ we find life and peace and a spiritual mind. It's, it opens our eyes to the spiritual things. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God. When I'm living in the world, I'm, I'm separated from God. I'm, I'm, my sins, they're at, they're at war with God. And God hates sin. He hates it because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. 
So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. If you're walking in the flesh, if you are in your flesh, living for your flesh, and you have not believed on Jesus Christ, and you've not repented and turned from your sins in belief and following of Jesus Christ, trusting in him, then you're walking in your flesh. And there is no way that you can please God. No way at all. So they that are in the flesh cannot please God. Are you in Christ or are you in the flesh? Ask yourself these questions. So then, um, I'm already in. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. But you are not in the flesh. Paul is talking to Christians here. He's talking to believers that have repented and that have followed Christ. They're following Christ. They're disciples of Christ. They're, they're learning about Christ. They are um, trusting in the blood atonement and the finished work of Christ. That they are free from their sins and they're no longer to walk as the world walks. That, Paul is talking to Christians. He's talking to me and you, too, hopefully. But if he's not, he's going to tell us exactly, by the end of this, we will know how to get exactly where he's talking about. There should be no doubt. But you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If so, be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. So there's got to be a transition. There's got to be something that comes alive in you, uh, a, a knowledge of knowing that the Holy Spirit of God has now placed himself in you and you are sealed with him and that all that you've done in your past life is no longer what defines you. From this point, from that point on, what defines you is your Father in heaven, and what defines you is the Holy Spirit of God that lives in you. That is now your new definition until you either give in to your flesh again and you ruin the testimony that the Holy Spirit has given you, and there's a process of starting that over. You don't lose the Holy Spirit, but the Holy Spirit has been taken over by your free will to feed your flesh, okay? Um, if you don't have that spirit in you, then you are in the world, then you are walking by the flesh. If Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. Now, the wages of sin is death, and the body is going to die because we sin, the, our physical bodies. But whenever we are in Christ, we are expediting that process. Not that our body physically dies, because we must have our bodies to be alive on this earth. But our body is dead because we are reborn as the Spirit, in the Spirit of the living God. So we don't. We put off these bodies. Meaning that I'm no longer constantly worried about everything being perfectly in the right place and, and constantly worried about how ages, the natural aging and the natural things that happen to man and, and woman as they, they grow older, as they get more experienced in life, those natural things. I'm no longer worried about the things of this body and I'm dead to this body. And meaning that this body is now strictly here to be used by the Holy Spirit of God that lives in me, that I'm no longer going to let sin control my members, that I'm no longer going to let my flesh make my decisions. I have a new spirit, I am a new creature, and I'm going to live in his ways, and he is going to give me the power to do that. Because if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness, because Jesus Christ came as a quickening spirit. He breathed that life back into us when we believed on what he did, on the finished work of Jesus Christ. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead that dwell in you, make no mistake about it, it's the same exact spirit. The spirit that, that rose Jesus from the dead is the same spirit that has been sealed in you. And if you have a cornerstone of Jesus Christ, 
and a foundation of the apostles and the prophets. And you have a building fitly framed together because you're in the word of God. That Holy Spirit has a perfect container that it is in and it is sealed up. And it can overflow into your life and it can overflow into your friends and your family's life. It can actually change not only you, but the people around you. But we must be doing and living according to God's word for that to happen. If we are not living according to God's word, then it may feel like our spirit is no longer in us. Because we've covered it up with sin. Our, our building, is our habitation is collapsed. In a house out of order, it collapses. So our habitation, we just have to build it back up. And how do we build it back up? By getting back to the foundation, the apostles and the prophets, by reading God's word, listening for God's voice, for the Holy Spirit to breathe these words into our being. We're listening for the Holy Spirit who speaks God's voice in us, through us, to us, through his word. As we learn the scriptures, as we understand the scriptures, as the Holy Spirit teaches us, he writes these things in our hearts and on our minds where we no longer have to run around with the Bible, but as we speak, we grow in Christ, as we exalt and as we do the will of God, as we work as Christians, as brothers and sisters, and we fellowship together, we begin to bond and we begin to make this family. It's a family of God that is ultimately going to live together in the kingdom of God. But it's time that we start acting like children of God like children of a holy father who is taking care of us and children of a righteous king who is coming to claim his throne. We should start to act those ways. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, you should be able to act those ways. You should be, you should be acting as Christ acted. You should be working as Christ worked. He that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. You see, you're, you're going to be made alive. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh. You owe nothing to the flesh. The flesh has done nothing but cause heartache and pain for you. Think about it. Every time you have made a decision with your flesh, what did it do? Every time you let your mind start wandering and racing on worries and problems that you have no control over, what did it do? Did it help you? Did it put you in a better place or a worse place? We owe nothing to the flesh other than to kill off the flesh. The flesh deserves death. We, we, don't, we don't elevate this body at all. It's flesh is flesh and with spirit is spirit. We're walking in the spirit of truth. And we have the Spirit of God living in us. We're putting off this flesh. If you live after the flesh, you shall die. But if you, through the Spirit, mortify the deeds of the body, you shall live. I'm going to tell you, this also is applies to life, our, our physical life. The more we can put off the deeds of the flesh, the longer, more purposeful, more meaningful life that we would have in Christ. That we would not shorten our life because we are poisoning ourselves with sin. And sin, make no mistake about it, is the deadliest poison that no one ever talks about anymore. Sin is what is driving 90, 100% of what you're seeing today. And the fact that we have people that are fighting for all the wrong things and they dress it up like it's the right thing we have people that are starving and people that are throwing food away by the ton we have people we're not living in the ways of the spirit of god we as a society it probably will never happen but we, as the children of God, we must walk in the ways of God. And it's not hard ways. It's loving each other and being more like Christ. It's, it's not, we're not having to get up and, 
and do all this everything the world what the world is asking you to do is the hard work what the world is asking you to do is what's killing us what you what what's become the new normal is what is killing us as a society because we're too focused on the law book of man on the psychology and the 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 wise words of men we're so focused on that we have discarded the the truth of god and the world has convinced us that we have to walk in those ways and that is the biggest lie ever we can begin now to walk in the spirit of god and we can be fully present in the spirit of god and we can see this world for what it is and we don't go after this the ignorant stuff that the world is telling us to constantly pursue if you say you have faith then you must live by faith and i i, I just think that we all live by what we're able to do with our hands period there's no faith in any, hardly any aspect of our lives. Only time we have faith now is when someone's sick or when we need something. But that's not faith. When you, you don't have faith in a healing, you have faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ. That God Almighty will provide everything I need. That if I gave everything away, that if I left everything, that God is going to provide for me. That he provides for the birds. Do we just say this stuff? Or do we know it to be true? I know it to be true. But we must live our life like we know it to be true. That if we're living in accordance to God's will, that he is going to provide every need we have. And he's going to give us opportunities to shine his light on others. You have not, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. And to be called a son of God, to be a son of God, they are the sons of God. It's not a title. It is who you are. It's your identity now. Are you walking in your identity? Are you walking in your father's footsteps? God, the father, not the father of the world, but the father. You know, we have a holy God who made himself equal to us so that we could be so that he can live and dwell in us. See, what Jesus Christ did was broke down all separation of us and God, the almighty, all-powerful, one and only living God Almighty. You know, Jesus Christ connected us to that throne of grace. Jesus Christ broke down that wall. It's through him. It's through he, everything that he did. We now have a pipeline to bow before God, to speak with God, to walk and talk and do the work of God. God lives in us. His spirit that raised Jesus Christ from the dead lives in us. You have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear. Your fear should be gone. The fear of this world, that's what that's the whole point. If you're if you're saying you believe in Jesus Christ, he's going to then if that is true and you are searching and you're looking for his ways and you're then you are going to lose your fear of the world. That the best and worst thing the world can do to you is kill you. Because the best, because you get to go home to be with this God. 
You get to sit at the throne of grace. You get to bow before it. You get to worship with the angels. That to live is Christ and to die is gain. That the world can only get you to your rewards. You know, that's why we have no fear of this world. But we have fear. We fear God. How can you love God and fear God? Just like you love your father, but you fear your father. You fear disappointing him. You fear the repercussions if you mess up and you do something wrong on purpose, on just being you respect and love your father and your father respects and loves you back or loves you back and returns that love but you also have a level of fear for your father you should the spirit itself beareth, beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God and if children we are heirs heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified, we may be also glorified together, that we have been made joint heirs with God, that, that Christ's inheritance is our inheritance, that we are children of God. That Christ came as the Son of God, and we have been made sons of God. That his inheritance, which is the throne of David, that he's going to reign and rule from for a thousand years, that's his inheritance, that it has also been made our inheritance. That we will be joint heirs with Jesus Christ. That we will actually receive what he receives. That his inheritance is our inheritance. If so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not even worried to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. You believe it or you don't. Do you believe this life is all you have? Then live it up. But if you believe there's more on the other side, then how do we know what's on the other side? What's well, all in here? Every word is. But the Holy Spirit of God is the one that reveals it to you. And you must be walking in that spirit. You must be searching these words. You must be listening to that spirit. That spirit will tell you all things, will reveal all things to you. Everything that God wants you to know, that spirit will write in your heart and put in your mind for remembrance. He's a comforter. He also brings the word of God to us from God and brings our words to the throne of grace and delivers them to God in a way that God can accept our prayers. The spirit living in you is the new you. That's why I'm being transformed into the image of Christ. My, my mind is being transformed, but my spirit is transformed it is the image of christ it is christ's spirit it's the holy spirit of god living in me the reason why i'm being transformed is one day christ is going to give me a new body and then i will be the image of the son of god i will be the image of jesus christ the spirit is a down payment it's the first portion and then the body is the final payment for the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who has subjected the same in hope. Because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. The, the whole creation is still groaning and they're still travailing in pain together. We, we, we are still in that pain together. Not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit. 
even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our body. You see, we're groaning with everyone else. We are groaning for the creation. We are groaning for the sins. We are, man, it's hard to live in this world. It's hard to live in this world. It's hard to see the things that are going on. And I believe that children of God and non-believers and everyone looks at this world and they're groaning for creation. But see, the children of God, they're groaning, they're groaning in a different way because we see the sin that is destroying everything that God created. We see the sin for what it is and we see the infection of Satan and, and evil taking over people that we love and things that we love and and it hurts we groan for the creation we groan and travaileth in pain together but we've received we who are in christ have received the first fruits of the spirit the first fruits and when jesus christ died and he was in the the heart of the earth for three days and three nights and then that morning uh, Mary, she was at the tomb, and, and Christ, he come walking up, and Mary did not know that it was him. She thought it was the gardener, which is an interesting thing. She thought he was a gardener, and, and Jesus spoke to her, and he, he, said, he said something, and, and she had, she had just kept her head down and he was lower in his voice and whenever she spoke and he spoke back and he said her name when jesus christ calls your name you're gonna you first of all when god calls on you to get to jesus christ you need to answer that call you need to answer that call you need to soften your heart and you need to give your life over to him but see there's going to be a point in time where jesus christ is going to call your name and when Jesus Christ calls your name, oh, that's, that's going to be, uh, there's, it's going to be unmistakable. Whether you're in Christ or out of Christ, every knee is going to bow, every tongue is going to confess that Jesus Christ is the Lord. That day will come. When he calls your name, if you're in Christ, it's going to be the best thing you've ever heard in your whole life. When he called Lazarus' name, Lazarus walked out of the tomb. If he had not called Lazarus' name, if he had just said, hey, come forth, then there's no telling how many people would have came out of the tombs. I long for Jesus Christ to call my name. I know when I hear my name that I will no longer, that I will get not just the first fruits that I have, his spirit, but I will get my final glorified body. See, when Jesus said Mary, she knew that Jesus just called her name because she had heard him call it. And she said, Rabbi, in teacher, it's you. You were dead. And she went to embrace him. And he said, don't cling to me. Because I must ascend. I must go up to my father. But why? Why me? He said, go and tell the others that I am alive. That I'm going to my father and I'm coming back. And I will meet you there. And what was Jesus Christ doing? Why, why that scene? Why did that happen? The, the first fruits was an offering in, Levit in, the, in the Old Testament that whenever you harvested, whenever you, you had your first harvest and, and, and the wheat and the barley harvest and to study that, uh, Aviv, it was whenever you, you got the first sheave of wheat and you were able to eat it. You were able to, um, you had to cook it, but you were able to eat it. And that was the first fruit from their crop. So they would take that sheave and no one in Israel could eat until that first sheep was bound and was waved in front of God, in front of his altar, and it was a, a wave offering the first fruits of God. The first fruits were offered to God. 
So when Jesus Christ, whenever he made atonement, whenever he, he spent time in the heart of the earth, and before he came and walked the earth, he must have had to go to his father. And he had to wave himself in front of his father as the first fruits. And through that whole process and his coming back to earth, and he met with his disciples, and then his ascension back into the throne room of heaven, sitting at the right hand of God, that first fruit, that spirit of first fruit that he waved in front of his father descended on us and it became this first fruit of the spirit. That's the down payment. That's what God gave us. That's what he put in us when we believed on him. We should be waiting on the final payment of our glorified bodies. We should be groaning and travailing for creation and seeing the sin and the hurt and the heartache and pain. For we, and not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our body. For we are saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why do he yet hope for? But if we hope for that what we see not, then do we with patience wait for it? Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth that what is the mind of the Spirit. Because he maketh intercession for us, for the saints, according to the will of God. That the Holy Spirit of God takes my prayers. He makes intercession. He, I know not what to pray. And whenever I pray, the words that I'm saying are not God's words. I, he, they can't be presented to a holy, perfect, and just almighty God the way that I'm saying them. But this Holy Spirit of God makes intercession and he takes my words and he gives them to God in a way that gets to him, in a way that he understands in accordance to the will of God. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God. Look, that's, this, we're talking about spiritual things. We're talking about spiritual things. Don't make it about material. That's the whole chapter is about putting off material, putting off the flesh. So, Let's make it about what it's really about in context of all things work together for good to them that love God. The Spirit of God overflows in them that love God, and that is a good thing, and that makes all things good. When something bad happens, we know it's going to be for the good and the glory of God. And therefore, it is for our good. That if God allowed it to happen, even the hard things, if God allowed it to happen, he has a purpose in his will for it. That we accept the things that we cannot control because in the next life, we will not have this suffering and pain. We have a reward that is greater than this world. And we have something, an inheritance to look forward to that is greater than the life we can build for ourselves. So we begin to live in that inheritance. Even though we haven't seen it, Abraham didn't see it. Jacob didn't see it. Moses got to see it. But all of these men lived their lives like they had already inherited the land because God told them they already had. 
And God tells me that I've already inherited these things. They're already mine. I have not seen it with my eyes, but I know it with my heart because I feel the Spirit of God living in me. And it's exactly what the Word of God says the Spirit of God is going to do in you if you live according to His Word, if you're walking in the Spirit daily and mortifying your members. It's that hope. It's that hope. We are saved by faith and hope, hope. It's, it's the finished work of Jesus Christ. See, we didn't see that, but we have witnesses that seen that, that know that to be true. And we should know that to be true. The evidence is overwhelming that we know Christ lived, that he died a sinner's death, that he rose again, and that these words that we're reading are not just a good story, but they are the words of God, and they are the testimony of the living God. They are the good news of our salvation, the good news of our hope, the good news of Jesus Christ, that we should be living and feeding on the Word of God daily, that it is our spiritual food, that we feed our spirit more than we feed our flesh. But if we hope for what we see not, then do we with patience wait for it? Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. We know that all things, for whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. And whom he called, them he also justified. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but he delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again. Who is even at the right hand of God, who is making intercession for us? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. The Bible is not confusing. People are confusing. The Bible is not chaotic. Satan is chaotic. The Bible is not hard to understand. The world is impossible to understand. We have let the world infiltrate our word. We've let the world infiltrate our hearts and our minds, our families, our lives. There's something being spoken about that's bigger than me and you here. There's something that we're being called to do that's bigger than me and you. There's a, a, a charge here to begin to walk in the Spirit, the Spirit that redeemed you, the Spirit that said, it doesn't matter what my past looks like, I know what my future looks like. It's a Spirit that says, it doesn't matter how many times I've messed up and how horrid the mistakes are. Because Christ died so that I may live free 
from a life that I lived in darkness, in chaos, in shame, in guilt. I had all that bondage on me in Christ through the power of his blood. He made a payment for what I had done and he paid it in full. And because he has paid for all that I did wrong and he did nothing wrong, that I am now following him. And then for trusting and following him, he actually puts the spirit, the perfect spirit of God in me. And I am no longer the old man that was dying every day in the sins, shame, guilt of this world. I'm no longer the old man that was working my life away with nothing to show for it. I'm no longer the old man who has who lost control of everything that God gave me. I'm no longer the old man who took the blessings of God and squandered them on the way of the world. But I've been made brand new and I have been bought with the precious blood of the Lamb and I have been washed in that blood. I've been made clean that those sins are not stuck to me that I left them in the past and if you want to dwell on them get after it but I'm not because Christ released me from them you can have them if you'd like them but you're not hurting me you're hurting yourself we have to know that Christ died for those sins we have to give him to him but if he made such a sacrifice for me, what kind of person would I be? If I let him die for my sins and I didn't at least follow him or listen to the words that he had to say about his death and about my life. He knew enough to die for me before I existed. He probably knows enough to tell me how to exist with him eternally. But I have to listen to him. Not to man, not to religion, not to the world, not to the most brilliant people you know. I have to listen to the words of God as they are sitting in front of each of us. Quit reading your Bible as little slogans, little scriptures and sayings and good sayings from the word of God do not help you get anything it, it actually confuses you because it's one verse out of thousands of verses and if you dwell on one or two you're missing the other thousand open your bibles find someone that teaches get you there is multiple ways to grow in christ but I'm going to tell you right now, if you're not spending time alone with God in prayer, we don't know how to pray. Understand that. Understand that when you get alone, you're free to speak to the Father however you want because we really don't know how to pray. But if we're trusting in Christ and His Spirit lives in us, we talk to Dad. We call on Him as our Daddy. And we know that the Spirit of God delivers those prayers from the Son to the Father. Do you believe the Bible? Do you believe what Christ did? Well, then I would ask you today, believe on what he did and begin to follow what he is telling you to do. And we can build that kingdom and we can begin to live in a different light, not this this dim fog, this darkness that the world is putting on us, but the light, the light on a hill, the light that the sun, it's the light of the sun. 
Nothing in this world is not touched by the sunlight. Everything under the sun gets touched by the sunlight. Everything in the world. The light of Jesus Christ. The light of Jesus Christ is brighter than that sun. Darkness cannot comprehend it. Let that light shine through you today. Let that light light your path and get on that narrow path. Begin to repent and get rid of the things that are separating you from God. Prayer, supplication, asking God, begging, pleading with God to begin a work in your life to begin to open the scriptures, to begin to help you to walk in the Spirit of God. We see what he's telling us that we should be. This is what the Spirit of God does for us. We're not doing any of these things. We don't get good enough to get the Spirit, and we don't get good enough to walk in the Spirit. We give all the things to God, and he begins to mold us and shape us. There's no program to get on. There's no... We begin to give it to God. And we begin to read His Word and, and see things for what they are and know that that's a temptation from the devil. This is a call from God. This is an action that God wants me to do. This is an action that Satan wants me to do. Holy Spirit reveals all things to the one who has him living in them. Make sure you have the Holy Spirit of God living, guiding, directing you. This day. Don't wait till tomorrow. Make sure that you are bought by the blood of the Lamb. Make sure that you are an heir with Jesus Christ, a son of God, and begin to look forward to the promises that God gives us. Begin to know that you have that inheritance. Begin to live as you are seated in heaven with Christ now. Because the same spirit in you is the same spirit in heaven. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word and we thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, and what he did for us. That He is the author and finisher of our faith, that we are standing on him, Lord. Lord, I ask for anyone out there who is struggling in life, who's having a hard time, who's trying to figure everything out for themselves, that you would show them the way of Jesus Christ. And you would call them to you this day. And today they would turn their life over to your son, Jesus Christ. That they don't have to wait on anyone else. They don't have to be perfect. They don't have to get rid of anything. That they just need to call and begin to follow in his steps. And he will begin to rid their life of all those things they're trying to get rid of. Lord, we thank you for always listening and always helping and always being there for us to guide and direct us. And Lord, we ask that you would continue to provide for us, Lord, the things that we need. And you would help us to glorify you with what we have. Lord, that we would never only look out for ourselves, that we would never just keep everything to ourselves, that we would be willing and wanting to help others, that we would help in your name, that we would give for your glory, that we would lift our fellow man, our brothers and sisters and those that are outside, those that are hurting, and those that are poor and hungry, and those that your son worked so hard while he walked this earth for. Lord, help us to reach those people. Help us to be a testimony 
for Jesus Christ and the light that he shines, let it shine from us. Lord, we ask that your spirit would begin to take over and that we would build a family that is ready to receive our king. Lord, we ask that your king, our king come. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank y'all. I hope y'all have a blessed day.